It's the year 2023 and still an opportunity to say Happy New Year. And that's how we welcome you to this edition of Business Week. I am Kelly Egiga and I'm reaching you from Lagos, Nigeria's commercial capital. Well, the race to Asurog has continued to gain new momentum even as presidential candidates of all the parties are seeking to rejig the economy by unleashing the energy of the youth, the farmers and the workers. We will make an attempt to dissect and scrutinize uh, the 85-page 2023 Renewed Hope document of the APC's presidential candidates, which captures the economic blueprint and policies of the party. But that conversation will take center stage in just a moment. Please stay with us. It is the political campaign season in Nigeria, featuring rallies, meetings and town halls. This is another of such gathering put together by the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, NESG, to provide an opportunity to engage with presidential candidates on the state of the Nigerian economy and discuss strategies to tackle the core issues, devouring growth and development. Present in this room are business leaders, private sector players, local and foreign investors, politicians, and key players in Nigeria's business environment. Chairman of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, Mr. Ni Yusuf, explains that key issues capable of shaping the economic trajectory need to be at the center stage in political campaigns, dialogue sessions, and all engagements leading to the general elections. Considering the enormous challenges facing us as, as a nation and comforting our economy, it is evident that the new government from 29th of May 2023 must be ready for office from day one and be ready to demonstrate an, underst an understanding of the issues and be capable of appointing the most competent people to key positions that can eat to run. The presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, took his time to highlight some notable challenges facing the business environment and investors' confidence in Nigeria. I do not embrace the conventional wisdom that physical deficits by the national government are inherently bad. All government especially this era of real currency, wrong circular budget deficits. This is an inherent part of modern government. The most part were the government, wrong deficits, as did the poorest nation. Look at Japanese example with high government borrowing and low inflation. The real issue is whether the deficit spending is productive or not. After a detailed presentation, Mr. Tinumbu also answered questions and took comments from the audience. Look at the bottleneck on the PIA itself. The one that we have right now, untie the bottleneck. Make accelerated action. You have proposals you submit today, you must have a timeline for the approval of that project. If I know as an investor that I'm giving you this proposal and expected a return within the next three, four weeks, and I get it, it's calendarized, I will bring my money. The ultimate aim is to ensure better macroeconomic stability by accelerating inclusive growth and job creation across Nigeria. Well, thank you indeed for staying with us here on Business Week. Now, let's head on to our big, big conversation. Just when a number of patriotic Nigerians were beginning to express concerns about the ethno-religious nuances of the messaging of the 2023 campaigns, the presidential candidate of the APC, Ashwa Jubola Ahmed Tinubu, uh, some weeks ago launched the 85-page Renewed Hope document envisioning the roadmap for governance if he and his running mate eventually are elected. But the document, it appears, should help to fundamentally refocus 
uh, discussions and conversations on the real issues indeed about the future of Nigeria, especially when you look at the economy, uh, national security, infrastructural and social development. Well, to dissect and scrutinize uh, the Renewed Hope document, I sat down for an exclusive conversation with a Nigerian finance professional, an economist, as well as an investment banker, Mr. Asukwo Ekwenyong Jr. Well, Mr. Ekwenyong Jr., among other achievements and appointments, uh, was a former commissioner of finance in Cross River State and now the APC's Southern Senatorial candidate in that state. Take a look. Former Commissioner for Finance, Cross River State, as well as uh, the candidates of the APC, Cross River South Senatorial District, uh, Mr. Soko Ekweyong Jr. It's an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you for having me. Yes, so, I mean, let's uh, begin why we are here and the fact that I will need your views and perspective on a number of issues. But I'd like to start with your speech or presentation um, on the Asiwa Jyotinabu's economic policy document on um, SMEs at the business community in Lagos a couple of months back. Can you just reflect on the major takeaways of your presentation? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Kelly. Um, my presentation was uh, focused on the small medium enterprise sector of Nigeria. Um, it's, um, as I said, at that presentation with um, the business community in Lagos, it's, um, it's the happy of the economy. If the small and medium enterprise is properly energized, it will serve as a catalyst for growth, economic growth in any country. In uh, Nigeria today, um, we have a large number of SMEs in terms of the percentage of them operating in the Nigerian economy. But the contribution to the gross domestic products is uh, comparatively small. Um, the quick way to expand the economy, energize the economy, would be to um, grow the SME sectors in geometric directions in leaps and bounds. And that can be done through adequate financing through um, skills acquisition and just generally um, creating um, safety uh, measures to ensure that SMEs can scale, can grow and contribute positively to the GDP of Nigeria. Yeah. Let's, let's move on and just get to talk about um, the document, 85 page uh, economic blueprints of your candidate. Um, the, the blueprint is proposing a 10% economic growth uh, targets. Uh, there are questions as to if this target is even achievable or, or possible. But then again, one also wonders with the current state of Nigeria's infrastructural deficit, 20 to 25% uh, gross domestic, so just how much of a possibility is this target? I think um, in life, the most important thing for overachievers or for people that achieve is that they are quite ambitious in their goals. Um, I've never met a man who scored an A who went out to score a C or was preparing to score a C in an exam. Um, where we are in Nigeria, we need we need a growth in the economy, and the APC's ten percent economic growth is one of the most ambitious I've seen for any of the political parties, and it's what is required for the time. Um, there's been two recessions under the current administration. Um, it's important to understand the global dynamics, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the recessions that have been instigated by the war in Europe, amongst other things. And uh, this has greatly dampened the growth of the Nigerian economy. So the, the a terrible Shetima administration coming will have to hit the ground running looking at 10% growth. Um, you speak about the infrastructure deficit, the gap in the infrastructure. Um, you are quite right in terms of your statistics, the approximate figures you give up. But it is in trying to bridge this infrastructure gap that you create economic growth. Because if, if you are aggressively pursuing a policy of bridging the infrastructure gap, you will be awarding contracts, you will be engaging with um, the manufacturing sector, you will be engaging with the construction sector. That leads to employment, that leads to um, 
you know, growth in um, money in circulation, and that the general multiplier effect which leads to further economic growth is as people, as government spends, um, there's uh, disposable income increases, demand increases in the economy, which leads to further um, increase in production, which leads to further employment. So the cycle continues and the economy starts to grow. So it is in the process of bridging the infrastructure gap, which are one of the many policies the Renewable Manifesto speaks to, that you, in, that you actually start creating the catalyst for the 10% economic growth rate for the economy. Yeah, we'll see how that uh, uh, that goes. Um, other issues, of course, uh, in that document um, is the fact that the document, of course, currently singles out the uh, digital economy as one low hanging fruit for foreign exchange earnings. Um, however, so some experts and analysts believe that um, Nigeria's or argue that Nigeria's potential in this regard was perhaps underestimated, and the argument is the fact that the consists of the fact that. Uh, we are um, a latent uh, cyber power. We are the seventh um, highest uh, internet, largest internet user in the, in, in the world. Uh, about 104.4 million uh, users in the world. We have a big, big advantage, of course, in our young, huge, and very fluent um, um, population. So I wonder, do, do you think this perhaps, you should use, do, you, uh, do you subscribe to the argument? In and let me just say this, I love critics. Um, especially what I love more is constructive critics. But it's, it's strange that um, in one breath, right, the critics have said the 10% economic growth was too ambitious. In another breath, they are saying that the, the figures or the estimates for the digital economy is understated. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a balance. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where would you have it? I mean, so, yeah. If it's understated, then it's a good thing. It means we'll surpass our targets, we'll surpass our goal. Um, the digital economy is, is, uh, is a major, major and untapped resource in Nigeria. We have a lot of young people who are very um, literate, you know, computer literate. They are very, um, they are very tech savvy. Mm -hmm. they, um, they are almost self-taught in terms of coding and um, software, development. software development and what, what they have done over time is they've taught themselves, they've deployed these skills themselves with little or no support from government. Now we're, we're talking about an administration that is coming in that is looking to, deli to, to be deliberate about developing this sector, that is looking to provide the support, um, whether it's with um, the broadband master plan, um, trying to ensure that there's internet penetration, whether it's by ensuring that you know young um, software developers have access to uh, adequately priced capital to be able to grow their businesses. But the ultimate goal is to ensure that Nigeria can start exporting jobs. And what I mean is a man sat in Calabar who has self-taught himself in coding can provide services to a company in Silicon Valley all the way across you know, the globe and is earning revenues in, in, you know, in USD and um, is generating income for the country. So that is what this, um, this part of the manifesto speaks to. It speaks to enabling our young, burgeoning um, tech startups and young coders and software developers to go into the market to survive and not just survive but thrive exponentially. And of course, another very critical part of uh, the renewed hope 2023 documents is the part that captures budgeting. I mean, Mr. President has only just given his accent uh, to the 2023 budget. Um, but page 14, of course, which captures uh, Ashwa Jutilibu's uh, position on budgeting. That's of the renewed hope. Of okay. the renewed hope. Okay. Yes, and perhaps you may uh, allow me to read that to you. Open quote uh, says, uh, budgeting custom basis of our annual budget and fiscal policies I remember that. largely on the dollar value of projected mm -hmm. oil receipts. And not only does this practice artificially restrict the federal government's fiscal latitude, it also attracts the nation's attention uh, towards a single source of okay. fiscal uh, receipts to the detriment of others. And end quote. I mean, but your, your presidential candidate was also picked to profess solution. Okay. Uh, and in his yeah, words, uh, he, he says, uh, quote, to achieve optimal growth in the long term, we must read ourselves from this 
a limitation and can go on and on and on. But um, I, I kind of agree with this, uh, the, the position of your presidential candidate. I mean, one uh, wonders um, how perhaps you would respond to this paradigm shifts. Is it a possibility? It is. And when you say a possibility, you make it seem as if it was never done before. We we budgeted beyond our revenues from the oil and gas sector in the past few decades ago. And that is the new vista, that's the new vision in which uh, um, uh, the TV administration will operate. Um, it, it's akin to saying, and I don't want to be overly simplistic, but if you had multiple income streams, not just your salary, and you were budgeting just off one, one, you know, income stream. Um, you put a lot of focus on that income stream, and you try and build it to the detriment of the other income stream. And that is what TDP speaks to. Nigeria has become somewhat of a mono economy because it's focused on oil and gas. Um, it's um, it focuses the budget purely based on or focus majorly on the income from the oil and gas sector. Of barrels per day, um, the barrel um, price per barrel for crude, and this limits us in terms of our growth and what we hope to achieve. What 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 Tinubu is saying is we should think about what as a country we would like to achieve in the course of that year, and go out, budget for it, and then work backwards to ensure that the revenues or the incomes are available to achieve that budget. And I think that over time in Lagos, they've done that. Um, I think if we were to say Lagos, we, so for most states in Nigeria, most states in, um, in this federation, their major source of uh, revenue is the federation accounts. Most states look to the federation accounts as their main income mm -hmm. for their expenditure. But what Tinibu did in Lagos, was to make the federation accounts take a backseat. They focused on what they needed to achieve to grow the economy, what they needed to do to bridge the infrastructure gap, what they needed to do to give a better standard of living to Lagosians. And then they went backwards and ensured that they could get that revenue available to meet those expenditure items. And so over time, we ended up seeing the federation accounts becoming a smaller and smaller percentage of their actual budget in terms of expenditure. And that gave rise to an improved IGR, improved efficiencies in collections, deploying of technology. That is what I think he speaks to here. Not what I think, I, that is what I believe he speaks to here. He is talking about in Nigeria where we are budgeting based on what we hope to achieve, the dreams and the, the goals and what is contained in the renewed manifesto. And we're ensuring that it's not just going to be one income stream that will be available to do that, but we're going to develop the other streams of income to the nation. All right, so uh, Mr. Epeyong, um, I mean, you have plans and visions for the Southern Senatorial Zone, um, I've seen, and of course, the word on the street, you know, confirm just how passionate you are. Uh, but talk to us from that window about uh, your plans for the people and how you perhaps intend to improve their standard of living. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad you asked that question, Kelly. The truth is, um, to answer that question, first of all, I have to go back as to why I'm running for office. Um, I found that no matter what, um, as much as you may be able to achieve in the private sector, um, if you want to positively affect the lives of people, the greatest way to do that is through public service. And that is what um, informed my, you know, my eagerness to run for office. Beyond that, first and foremost, how I intend to engage with them or better their life, I feel for everything I've ever achieved in this life, beyond the grace of God, it has always boiled down to um, the education I had. And education doesn't just mean the formal education system in the classroom, it's what I learned from people, what I learned when engaging with people, how I learned to teach myself. And for me, first and foremost, if you're to build a better society, 
no matter how much you focus on today, if you're not thinking about tomorrow, you will have a problem in society in the long run. So for me, first and foremost on my legislative agenda is education. Trying to ensure that you can have, you can give every bright mind the, the opportunity to learn. And not just learn formally, but put them, and engage them in a space where they are engaged with mentors and people that can teach them and pass on knowledge and teach them how to learn. So for me, I feel as though, um, with regards to our education, yeah, in Crush of South, that you can go beyond just the formal classroom, but also teach people, like we spoke earlier about the digital economy, one of the things that's foremost on my agenda is to be able to teach people the new skills that are required to succeed in today's world, um, from tech to just um, software development, coding, things that allows them to earn from beyond their immediate environment. Uh, we intend to ensure that we can offer as much scholarship as possible to those who have the capacity but don't have the ability um, to go to school. When I, I mean ability, I mean financial resources. Things down to bursary payments are going to be top on my legislative agenda. So the first pillar for me will be education. The second has to do with entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship in the sense of we spoke about small medium enterprises, the lifeblood of any economy. If you get SMEs right in any sector, because there's only so much you can assist people, but if you can get people to you know provide revenue, um, income for themselves, provide the enabling environment, then you know you get a better society. So for me, is to ensure that we can work with SMEs, grow SMEs in our in our senatorial district fight for the, the right capital, rightly priced capital, and make it readily available for deserving SMEs so that they can grow their business, they can scale, and they can prosper. Um, last but not least is infrastructure. And infrastructure is not something for you know a legislature, but it has to do with the executive. And most of the critical infrastructure that is required in uh, parts of Cross River South because of our terrain, because of um, the maritime nature and riverine nature of Cross River South, uh, whether it's bridges, whether it's building roads in very swampy areas, you need a lot of intervention from the federal government or from intervention agencies like the NDDC. So for me, infrastructure is a third pillar because no matter how much you know the small and medium enterprises or businesses are trying to try, if they don't have the infrastructure for evacuation, if they, have, if they don't have the infrastructure so that their businesses can earn sustainable profit margins, then they are all going to fail. So getting the right level of infrastructure and that means lobbying, engaging with the intervention agencies, engaging with the ministries and departments, ensuring that roads are fixed, ensuring that roads are built, bridges are built, things are earmarked and put into the budget accordingly. Nigeria is a very vast country. We have 774 local governments in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Within my senatorial district, there are seven local governments. If you can imagine all these local governments competing for the attention of the federal government or intervention agencies. You have to be a hard-working lobbyist, you have to be able to network properly and that is the role and the way I see myself. These are my legislative agenda as I see it, infrastructure, entrepreneurship and education. Well, perhaps a fine place to anchor a conversation with you, former Commissioner for Finance Cross River State, as well as uh, the candidate on the APC in the Cross River State Southern Senatorial District, Mr. Sukwe Bayong Jr. Thank you indeed for your insights, analysis and perspective on the program. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to coming back on this program on February 26th, where you will, um, I think you will congratulate <laughs>Well, fascinating insights there. It's always, always an absolute pleasure to speak with the former Commissioner of Finance in Cross River State and the APC Southern Senatorial Candidate, Mr. Asukwo Ekbayong Jr. And that exclusive conversation does it for us here on this edition of Business Week. I'll see you again next time. I am Kelly Ejiga. Bye now.